it's now my great pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Dr. Tyler Weaver. Tyler did his undergraduate degree in science at Florida State University before moving to Iowa to pursue his PhD with Catherine Musselman, where he used protein DNA bi biochemistry and NMR to start interactions between the histone reader domains and histone post-translational modifications. Um, for his postdoc, Tyler moved to the University of Kansas to join the lab of Brett uh, Friedenthal, where he has investigated how base excision repair enzymes access and process DNA damage within chromatin. Today, he's going to share his work on the structural basis for APE1 processing DNA damage in the nucleosome. I've seen buzz about this project on Twitter, so I'm especially excited to get to hear about this work. So please join me in giving a warm, if virtual, welcome to today's first speaker, Dr. Tyler Weaver. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Ben. Um, yeah, so I'm actually really excited uh, to tell you all about some of our our work trying to understand how DNA damage is repaired in the context of chromatin. Um, and so what I'm gonna talk about today in the title of my talk is, is the structural basis for APE1 processing DNA damage in the nucleosome, okay? And so as I mentioned, this work is unpublished, so um, we welcome any feedback that you all may have. Okay, and so I wanna start with a little bit of background on, on DNA damage and DNA damage repair. Um, and so our lab is interested in, in DNA damage. And so as many of you are familiar with, uh, our cells are constantly exposed to both uh, endogenous and exogenous stressors um, that, that can result in DNA damage uh, or the chemical modification of our DNA bases. Okay. If this DNA damage is left unrepaired, it can ultimately lead to the accumulation of mutations, genomic instability, or, or disease states such as cancer. Uh, and so our lab maintains a, an interest in understanding how the cell repairs DNA damage. Um, and the pathway that, that we're mainly interested in and the one I'm going to talk about today is, is the base excision repair pathway. And so I want, I want to walk you through this pathway. And so base excision repair is the cell's primary defense against uh, multiple types of DNA base damage. So, so this is damage specifically to the DNA nucleobase. Uh, and so the pathways uh, uh, initiated through the induction of DNA base damage. This DNA base damage is, is recognized by a type of enzyme known as a DNA glycosylase. Okay, the DNA glycosylase binds the, the DNA base damage, excises the damaged DNA base, leaving behind a, a, a DNA repair intermediate we call an AP site or, or a baseless sugar moiety. The AP site is then processed uh, by a second enzyme in the pathway, the, the enzyme I'm, I'm going to be talking about today, which is AP endonuclease 1, so uh, also known as APE1. So APE1 binds the AP site and then uh, cleaves the phosphate backbone 5' prime of, the a, uh, of the AP site, generating a 5' prime NIC. And for the sake of time, I'm not gonna walk through the rest of the pathway, but there's two additional enzymes, DNA polymerase beta, which basically adds a non-damaged nucleotide in place of what was previously the damaged nucleotide. And then a DNA ligase complex, complex which seals the NIC. And so ultimately what base excision repair does is, is it restores the coding potential of the DNA uh, and, and prevents the accumulation of mutations. And so most of what we know from, from many labs, including our own about each of these base excision repair proteins has come from a lot of great in vivo work, as well as a, a ton of, of really important in vitro work, um, studying each of these enzymes using kind of uh, in vitro biochemistry and structural biology. Um, but all of these studies have really focused on base excision repair in the context of free duplex DNA. And so I think we're all familiar with, with the fact that genomic DNA doesn't exist always as free duplex and instead can exist in a multitude of higher order structures, including but not limited to, you know, our favorite, at least at this seminar series, which is chromatin. Um, and, and the nucleosome. And so I'm going to spend very little time on this slide, but, but I think we're all familiar with the fact that chromatin is really the eukaryotic mechanism for pack, packaging our genome. And this is carried out by a fundamental repeating unit known as the nucleosome core particle, a structure of which uh, is shown here on the left. And, and so the, the nucleosome really consists of two major components. It, it consists of an octameric histone protein complex, um, which, which contains two each of the four different histone proteins. And then the second major component is, is the nucleosomal DNA. And this is a, approximately 147 base pairs of nucleosomal DNA that wraps around this histone octamer. And so for the rest of the talk, when, when I talk about the nucleosome, I, I want you to think of it in the same way that many of our, our previous speakers have, and that the nucleosome is really a dynamic regulatory um, regulatory component um, that, that uh, is important for, for accessing the underlying DNA sequence. And in the context of DNA damage, or in the context of DNA repair, this mean, means it's an important regulatory barrier for, for uh, accessing damaged DNA bases. Okay, 
And so I want to summarize uh, about 15 years worth of work in, in the basic decision repair field. Um, um, and, and what I think is, is really probably one of my favorite figures uh, um, in, in a paper recently. And so this work was done by John Y. Ricca's lab at Washington State. And, and what they did is they were basically trying to understand how efficiently DNA damage is repaired and chromatin in particular, a, a type of DNA base damage known as seven methylguanine. So this base damage is funneled through the base excision repair pathway. And so what they did is, is they basically correlated the amount of this seven methylguanine that was repaired um, with the position of, of the DNA damage uh, in relation to, to strongly positioned nucleosomes and yeast. And there's really two things that I wanna point out. And in my opinion, two, two of the most important things for how uh, basic excision repairs activity is regulated in chromatin. The first is that the translational position of the DNA damage or the position of the DNA damage in relation to the nucleosome dyad um, is, is a, a key determinant for repair efficiency. So DNA damage that, that, that's found at the dyad is, is repaired less efficiently than that of the ends or the termini of the DNA, which are known as the, the nucleosome entry exit site, okay? So the second thing you might notice in, in this basic excision repair profile is that there's oscillations as well between kind of low activity, high activity, low activity, and high activity. Um, and this actually stems from something we call rotational position of, of the DNA damage. And, th and this is simply the result of the helical nature of, of the nucleosomal DNA, where the phosphate back, the conformation of the phosphate backbone basically rotates from being in an inward facing orientation towards the histone octamer to five, base pair, uh, five bases later being in an outward facing conformation tor towards solvent exposed. And so the translational position and the rotational position of DNA damage is, is a key determinant for, for base excision repair efficiency in vivo. And so ultimately what our lab is interested in doing is, is really understanding how each of these base excision repair proteins searches for DNA damage, how they engage DNA damage, and then how they process DNA damage in the context of chromatin and, and really, look, or really uh, using the nucleosome core particle um, a, a, as our model system. Um, and so I'm not gonna have time to talk about all of these proteins, but what I am gonna talk about today is a, uh, AP endonuclease one or AP1, which just as a reminder uh, is the enzyme that binds an AP site and, and cleaves five prime of it. The rationale for doing this is, is AP1 is simply one of the first enzymes on the scene, whether it's acting downstream of the DNA glycosylase. Um, in addition, uh, uh, AP sites can also be spontaneously generated um, in the genome in the absence of DNA glycosylase activity. And these also get funneled into BER through AP1. Okay. And so the two questions that I wanna to answer today are, are actually very simple and, and I think very foundational and, and, and that's these, these two questions. How efficiently does AP1 process AP sites in the nucleosome? And then, um, and, and then how is this uh, efficiency regulated depending on where the AP site's located? And then in the second part of my talk, I wanna focus on a little more structural biology where we're trying to understand how does AP1 engage AP sites in the nucleosome? And again, how is this regulated depending on where the, the AP site is located? And so to address these questions, our lab utilizes in vitro biochemistry and structural biology. Um, and so when I started in the lab, one of the first things we needed to do was basically optimize a method for generating recombinant nucleosomes that contain site-specific DNA damage. Um, and I'm not gonna have a ton of time to walk through how we do this, but I, I will say uh, that we, we've recently submitted a step-by-step -step protocol for doing so. And so if anybody's interested in how to do this, feel free to email me and I can shoot you a copy of that. And so basically what we did was we started by, by generating nucleosomes containing AP sites at three different locations. Um, and, and these three locations represent kind of high, medium, and low repair from the, from the in vivo repair profiles I showed you a few slides ago. Um, and so the first location is at the entry exit site at superhelical location minus six and, and has a rotational position that's outward facing. The second location or, or the medium repair location is at superhelical location minus six and a half and has a rotational position that's inward facing. And then finally, the last uh, AP site location is at the nucleosome dyad. And so this is a different translational position uh, than the other two. Okay. And so with these reagents in hand, we then wanted to start by asking that the, the first question, a very simple question. How efficiently does AP1 process these AP sites? And so to address this, we, we turned to really a, a bread and butter experiment in the Friedenthal lab, which is, is pre-steady state enzyme kinetics, in particular single turnover uh, pre-steady state enzyme kinetics. And so what these experiments allow us to do is they allow us to determine a very important rate constant, um, which is known as K observed. And in the case of AP1, what K observed represents is a cleavage rate of AP1 for an AP site. 
And so I'm gonna walk you through some of this data where we've done these single turnover experiments at each of these three nucleosome locations. And for simplicity's sake, I'm just gonna walk you through the data in a table form. And so just to orient everyone, APE1 processes uh, uh, AP sites in free duplex DNA with a K observed of 441 per second. This is extremely rapid and, and to put it into context, it's, it's one of the most rapid DNA processing enzymes in the cell. So next, we started by, by doing these experiments at the, at the high repair AP site location. And what we found quite interestingly is that AP1 actually uh, has a cleavage rate of, of 498 per second at this location, which is almost identical to its cleavage rate in free duplex DNA. So AP1 will readily process um, uh, this, this high repair uh, AP site location. So next, what we did is, is we, we asked the question, what happens if you move the rotational position to an inward facing orientation, but, but maintain the translational position? And what we found is that APE1 processes this, this medium repair site with a K observed or a cleavage rate of 0.12 per second. So this is about 3,680 fold down from free duplex and from the high repair AP site location. Okay. And so finally, what happens if we move this to the nucleosome dyad or, or the low repair site? I mean, as it turns out, APE1 is, is pretty inefficient at, at cleaving this substrate and, and it has a, a, a K observed of 1.3 times 10 to negative four per second, which is 3.4 million fold down from free duplex and, and the high repair location. And so to summarize this data, basically APE1, uh, APE1's activity, much like those in vivo repair profiles I showed you, is highly dependent on the rotational and translational position of the DNA damage. And this can vary uh, anywhere from three orders to six orders of magnitude. And so the last thing I want to point out, though I'm not really going to have time to talk about this, is that despite having vastly different K observed, APE1 actually has similar apparent KDs for each of these AP site containing nucleosomes. So, so at least in the context of global nucleosome binding, uh, APE1 binds each of these uh, with, with, with similar affinity. Okay. And so in the second part of my talk, and, and really probably my favorite part of the talk, is, is where we start to, to try and understand how APE1 engages AP sites in the nucleosome. And so because we now have AP site locations that uh, APE1 has high activity, medium, and low, these are actually really, really important um, uh, tools for then studying how APE1 engages at, at, at different kind of um, positions within the nucleosome. And so to address this, what our lab does is, is we utilize a combination of cryo-EM as well as single molecule fluorescence. Um, and, and so I'm not gonna have time to talk about each of these locations today, but what I do wanna do is, is, is tell you a little bit about a, a structure we've determined of APE1 bound to this, uh, this high repair location. But before I do, I wanna briefly provide a little bit more information about the mechanism APE1 utilizes to, to access AP sites and free duplex DNA. So what I'm showing you here on the left is a, a crystal structure of APE1 bound to um, a, a free 10 or 15-ish base pair free duplex DNA substrate. And so it turns out that APE1 utilizes a, a mechanism that we call in the DNA repair field, a DNA sculpting mechanism to access AP sites. So what it does is it, it generates a bend in, in the free duplex DNA of approximately 35 degrees, where this bend angle is centered on the position of the AP site. And what this ultimately allows APE1 to do if we zoom in on this DNA and remove APE1 from the picture is it allows APE1 to, to basically take the AP site from an intrahelical conformation and flip it out into its active site where it can then cleave five prime uh, of the AP site. And so this DNA sculpting mechanism is, is extremely important for, for APE1 accessing AP sites. And so the first thing we wanted to do is we basically wanted to understand very, from a very simple perspective, how does APE1 do this in the context of the nucleosome? So what we did is, is we turned to cryo-EM and I think most of us are familiar, familiar now with cryo-EM and, and it's kind of power and how powerful it is in determining protein bound structures to, to the nucleosome. And so what we were able to do is we were able to determine a 3.3 angstrom cryo-EM reconstruction of APE1 bound to uh, the nucleosome containing the high repair AP site. Uh, and, and the map of, of this is shown here on the left. And what this enabled us to do is essentially generate a, a reconstruction of the nucleosome, uh, or nucleosome APE1 complex, um, utilizing the high resolution crystal structures of the nucleosome that have been previously solved, as well as high resolution crystal structures of APE1 um, that, that Brett has solved. And so now I want to walk you through the last couple of minutes. Uh, uh, I want to walk you through the, the structure and some of the global things that we found that are, that are really quite cool. And so just to orient everyone, uh, the nucleosomal DNA is in orange. I'm going to color the whole histone octomer in gray, and I'll get to why that is in, in a few slides. 
And then uh, ape one is colored in blue. Okay. And so I, for, from here on out, I'm gonna refer to this as, as the ape one nucleosome complex. So in the ape one nucleosome complex, ape one is bound to the nucleosomal DNA between the major grooves of superhelical location minus five and a half and minus six and a half, okay? This ultimately gives ape one an effective footprint of approximately 10 base pairs on the nucleosomal DNA, where the center of this footprint is the AP site at superhelical location minus six. And so ape one interacts with the nucleosome via really three distinct interfaces. Um, the first two interfaces are actually very similar, and they consist of a series of positively charged uh, side chains of ape one that non-specifically interact with the phosphate backbone of the major groove at superhelical location minus five and a half and minus six and a half. Whereas the third interface, not unsurprisingly, is actually ape one's active site, which coordinates the AP site in the minor groove at superhelical location minus six pictured here. Okay. And so one of the first things that we noticed that was, that was really interesting to me is that ape one doesn't actually make any contacts with the histone octomer. Its complete interface with the nucleosome is, is simply through interactions with the nucleosomal DNA. And so we think that, that this is likely one of the reasons that ape one um, is able to efficiently process this AP site and maybe not so much uh, uh, the, the medium and the low access the, or the medium and low repair sites that I previously showed you. And so next, we wanted to ask a second very simple question, and, and that's, can ape one sculpt nucleosomal DNA the same way that it does free duplex DNA? And so to address this, we solved the second uh, cryolium structure of a nucleosome containing an AP site in the absence of ape one uh, to a global resolution of 3.4 angstroms. And what I'm showing you here and highlighting is, is that there's an intrinsic bend angle of the nucleosomal DNA at the entry exit site near where the AP site is. It's around 15 degrees. And when we compare this to the structure of ape one bound to the same AP site location, what's really cool is that we found ape one actually does indeed sculpt the nucleosomal DNA. And this nucleosomal DNA sculpting is mediated by a, an approximately 35 degree bend angle. And I'm not gonna have time to talk about this extensively, but though ape one doesn't interact with the histone octomer, utilizing this DNA sculpting mechanism, it actually breaks contact between the nucleosomal DNA here and the alpha and, alpha and helix of histone H3, which I'm sure many of you know is a hotspot for histone post-translational modifications. Okay, and so the last two slides, I, I really wanna talk a little bit about the AP site and, and then how this compares to free duplex DNA. So if we zoom in on, on this uh, ape one nucleosome bound complex, what I want to point out is that, is that the sculpting of the nucleosomal DNA ultimately leads to uh, ape one being able to, to evict the AP site from the DNA helix into an active site cavity, which is shown here as a surface representation in blue. Okay. And so ultimately, just like free duplex DNA, nucleosomal DNA sculpting allows access to the AP site. And then finally, I'm gonna end by, by comparing our, our nucleosome bound structure of ape one to, to that of a structure Brett solved about six years ago of ape one bound to, to free duplex DNA uh, containing an AP site. So I'm not gonna walk through this extensively, but I hope that all of us can see, uh, even us non-structural biologists, that these structures superimpose almost perfectly. Okay, and what we think this means is that ape one utilizes a common mechanism for cleaving AP sites in free duplex DNA and in the context of the nucleosome. Um, with the caveat being that this has to be a, a, a accessible or highly repair or highly um, repaired AP site location. Okay. And so just to, to finish, I want to briefly summarize what I told you today. So I, I told you that ape one processes AP sites in the nucleosome with different efficiencies. And this largely depends on where the AP site is located, both in terms of rotational and translational position of the AP site. I then walked you through a structure of ape one bound to a nucleosome containing an AP site. Um, where we found that ape one sculpts the nucleosomal DNA, which allows it to ultimately kind of get that AP, AP site out of the helix and into its active site. And then finally, uh, at least at these accessible AP site locations, this is accomplished using a very similar mechanism uh, that ape one uses for free duplex DNA. And so with that, I'd just like to give some brief acknowledgements, obviously Brett for, for taking me on as a postdoc uh, two and a half years ago. I also want to thank um, some really talented grad students in our lab, Nicole Hoitzma, who's helped with uh, the enzyme kinetics, as well as Ben Ryan. Um, uh, and then finally, an, an undergrad in our lab, Jonah Spencer, who pretty much helps me with everything. And he's, he's a really great undergrad. And then finally, I just want to thank our fun, my funding source, which is a F32 through NIGMS. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions if we have time left. Thank you, Tyler. That was fantastic. Such a good talk. 
Um, so just a reminder for people, if you have questions, you can type them into the Q&A or you can click the raise hand button and ask your question yourself. I'll get started. Like I was really struck by just how strong an effect the nucleosome has on APE1 activity. And I was wondering, is it known if in the cell if APA1 or APE1 has like cell inner partners that can help facilitate it accessing sites deep within the nucleosome? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And the short answer is, um, so obviously chromatin remodelers are probably going to play some type of role, but I think it's more of a stochastic role. So it, at least to my knowledge, APE1 doesn't really directly interact with, with many of the known chromatin remodelers. Um, however, um, uh, APE1 does interact um, and several basic scission rep uh, repair proteins interact with, um, with PARP. Um, so that's kind of a chromatin regulator that we're all familiar with, as well as a, a scaffolding complex called XRCC1. And, and so some of those might regulate some of the less accessible lesion locations. We also have to keep in mind that these experiments were also done with, with the strong positioning 601 sequence. So DNA, DNA sequence could play a role, histone PTMs, variants, et cetera. But yeah, there's, there's most likely protein partners that can facilitate this within the cell. It's likely why the magnitudes of, of repair in vitro and in vivo are, are, are not quite the same. Yeah. Is that something that you're thinking of following up on in terms of like the DNA sequence role or histone PTMs? Yeah. So, so, so we're, we're yeah we maintain an interest in histone post translational modifications sequence as well though um, as as most of us are probably familiar with changing the sequence and still obtaining high resolution cryo-EM structures can be difficult but it's something that we're moving towards yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, I think we're out of time so we'll. we'll We'll finish up there, um, but I'll encourage people to stay for the coffee chat if you want to ask more questions. Um, so thank you again, Tyler, for the fantastic talk.